Okay, hopefully the clicker works. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Mitch. I've just started my PhD, so this is a student presentation. Keep that in mind. I'd like you to rate it at the end of the talk. Uh, I'm doing my PhD at Monash University, supervised by Rob Heinemann and Georgia Thanasopoulos. Uh, you may know me by my work in the R statistics of forecasting stuff, the Fable package in particular. I've also helped develop the forecast package. And this research came up as a tangent from uh, some new features that I was developing in Fable for improving reconciliation. And I thought it made a lot of sense, and I'd like to share that with you today. So the title's a bit long, and what I'm really going to focus on is just reconciliation of graphs. And to start, I'm going to give you a bit of a primer on reconciliation. So this might be a bit basic for everyone here. If you haven't seen reconciliation, it might be useful, though. Uh, let's consider how many forecasters we expect to attend next year's ISF and beyond. So you can just forecast the future attendees using your favorite ETS or ARIMA from the previous talk, or perhaps some more sophisticated models. It's not so bad. But how many attendees will be here from academia and industry? Well, you can forecast those as well. You can forecast them independently, no problem. But there's a problem. Something doesn't quite add up here. Uh, because we've produced them independently, they're not going to be coherent. So the sum of the parts will not equal the total. So we want to impose this constraint. We want to ensure that the data is coherent and the forecasts are coherent with that. So we require that the total attendees is equal to the sum of the academic attendees and the industry attendees as well. And we often represent that with a matrix because we have lots of constraints. You might end up with a really large hierarchy. And I'm going to try and keep it to really simple hierarchies today and not focus on math at all because it's a graph talk. Uh, compactly, you represent this with yt is the summation matrix, S, times the bottom level series. So if you're able to compute this B, uh, bottom level, and sum it, you're guaranteed this coherence. And this is uh, set up in this paper here. But it's not quite easy to read these matrices, especially when you've got large hierarchies. So we like to use these graphs to represent them. And if you learn about this in all the textbooks, you'll see represented with graphs. And the edges of this graph, in this case just 0 and 1, 1 if there is a graph, uh, this corresponds to the summation or structural matrix. But you can have uh, th some edges that are not equal to 1. You can have negative edges, positive edges, perhaps even nonlinear edges. If you wanted to reconcile this, you can use uh, various methods. One way is min t. I'm not going to focus on this because it's a graph talk. Uh, so the great value of producing reconciled forecasts is that you get a more reasonable, coherent result. But you also get an accuracy improvement as well. You can leverage information across an entire hierarchy to get more uh, information at each series. So let's think about graphs now. So the, the data we saw, the hierarchy we saw before, is a hierarchy, but often they have multiple layers or more, and it's not necessary, ba necessarily balanced. So here I've split up academic further into students and staff. And in graph terms, this is known as a polytree. Uh, grouped coherence is a little bit more complicated, but still well within the known area of reconciliation. What if we instead considered domestic and international travelers to the conference? So you can split attendees in much the same way as before. But what about the attendee origin mixed or uh, grouped with academic or industry uh, workplaces? So we can disaggregate it in both of these ways and then further disaggregate by the other pair. So we get these two trees. And often I see it represented in this way. And it's not exactly right because the bottom level here is the same. They should be a single graph where the bottom level is connected with um, the same top level in this case as well. So by definition, a grouped uh, coherence constraint has the same top level, in this case just attendees, and the same bottom level, in this case the interaction between where you've come from, uh, international or domestic, and the type of work that you're doing, industry or academic. Putting this all together in a graph, uh, we get what is called in graph terms a directed acyclical graph. And this is uh, pretty much the main part of the research uh, that I'm presenting. Uh, it's a constrained directed acyclical graph because the top and bottom level nodes must be shared. So let's think about relaxing that constraint today. Uh, before we do, though, I'm going to full screen, actually. There we go. That's nice. Uh, temporal coherence is a relatively new uh, development. 
2017 paper listed there. But it's not just cross-sectional attributes that you can disaggregate or aggregate with. You might consider the total uh, number of attendees by year. I know we don't attend multiple times a year, but uh, you can imagine a different example like tourism for this. Uh, the year must be the sum of the quarters, and the quarters must be the sum of the months within that quarter. So you end up with this uh, constraint structure here. What type of coherent structure is this? In this case, it's a polytree. So our constraint structure, our coherent structure, is hierarchical. But we can also consider other ways to disaggregate time. We can also split years into uh, groups of months, so January to April, four-month sequences, and then they're the equal to the sum of the four months below them. And in this case, we have a grouped constraint because the top and bottom levels are the same, but the way we got there is different. So there's multiple constraints at play. And in a graph, you can also represent this, and it works out that temporal coherence is the same as grouped coherence, and you see the multiple colors there representing the different pathways down to the bottom level. So that's a DAG as well, directed acyclical graph. Now, since we have uh, both grouped and temporal coherences being DAGs, we can also naturally create cross-temporal hierarchies. And they're the two graphs that I showed before. Essentially, if you take the top level of either of these graphs, so that's the one right in the middle of these two, and place that in every node of the other graph, you'll end up with a cross-temporal graph. It would be far too big to show here, so that's why I've not done that. Um, and all of these graphs that I've shown so far, it's possible, and not too difficult, to convert this into the summation matrix that we saw before. And therefore, we can make use of all the nice min trace and various other methods for reconciliation and get our optimal forecasts, coherent forecasts. Now for the new stuff. What about graph coherence? So we saw that the grouped coherence required the top and bottom series to be the same, to share a common identifier. But the DAG doesn't require the same top and level uh, top and bottom level series. So what if we relax this constraint? This will be a more general structure, but is it reasonable to leverage this more general uh, behavior? Yes, and this is why. So unbalanced graphs, this is when we change the bottom level time series to be a different uh, disaggregation. So this open, often comes up in a couple of places that I'll uh, discuss. In particular, I really like cross-temporal hierarchies where each of the series that you might observe in the cross-sectional might be observed at different frequencies. And then the other one is that you might have completely different paths to get to the top level. So of course, the bottom is going to be this different there. So firstly, let's consider sales, a very simple example. Uh, we get sales figures every quarter, but the profit and the costs are only reported twice every year. So we have different frequencies of the observations here. But it's still possible to set this up as a directed acyclical graph. And the advantage of this, the advantage of this is that we can leverage the more higher frequency information from the sales data, the quarterly information, even though we don't have quarterly sales, oh, sorry, month, did I say quarterly? Yeah, quarterly sales, even though we don't have biannual uh, profit and costs data. So we can kind of traverse up this graph or the summation matrix, to leverage information from the other series in order to improve our forecasts even at the quarterly level for sales. Now, we can also consider if there's completely different approaches to calculating the top series. A great example that has been used quite often in the recent literature is Australian GDP. There's three, three different ways to compute Australian GDP used by the Statistical Office, the Bureau of Statistics, and they are completely different in structure. And I'm going to do a very simple, only the top level of this. But in practice, they're quite deep and many different series that sum up to this. And it can look quite complicated. So just considering the top level for the first two, income and expenditure, you might consider GDP is the sum of income and taxes. And there's some statistical error that we call discrepancy here. And expenditure is the uh, expenses, exports minus imports, and some more error here. Of course, these disaggregate far more. You end up with two very large trees, which both have the same top level node. But the very bottom of these, and in fact, the whole pathway to the bottom, looks completely different. Very different time series. And in fact, this example for the production that I'm not showing has that temporal uh, inconsistency 
that I was talking about before. Different frequencies, some are reported annually, uh, others are reported quarterly. So very simply, we can structure this with a combined approach, simply putting the common GDP as the top level and then identifying its subcomponents with some colored lines. This is a directed acyclical graph, uh, a lot simpler than the complete one. So yes, it has some value to have a different bottom level with the same top level. But what does it mean to have different top levels of a series? We don't often consider aggregation trying to sum up to a different thing. But this also has value, and I like to think of this as a disjoint graph, although there are some structures that you can create which aren't completely disjoint. The simplest of which uh, is when you've got multiple top series in a cross-validation approach. If you have cross-validation, you're splitting up the time series into incrementing windows or sliding windows, and you want them to be completely separate when you create your models, your forecasts, and possibly reconcile them as well. So what you end up with is multiple graphs, multiple trees uh, for each of these cross-validation folds. Another benefit, which I'm not going to show, I'll show the cross-validation next, uh, partial local coherency. Maybe you're summing up the total population by sex and by various other uh, attributes, and you're doing this for each country in the world, but you don't care about the total population of the entire world. Perhaps that's not part of the research interest and you want to simplify the hierarchy quite a lot. Um, perhaps not that much, but it's an option to, to you with this concept. Uh, you can just choose not to aggregate, not to make it coherent at that wo worldwide level. <coughs> and you end up with separate graphs for each country, which you can reconcile in a directed acyclical graph, but doesn't meet the definition of grouped constraints. So looking deeper into the cross-validation, of course it makes no sense to aggregate across separate folds. So the suitable DAG has completely separate graphs for each of those folds. I've just shown three. Of course, you might have many more. And the advantage of using DAGs to represent this as opposed to matrices, if you use matrices, you'll end up with this block diagonal. Um, and of course, you can use more efficient algorithms to handle that nicely as well. But using graph structures, you can use all the graph theory algorithms, all the niceness that comes from that, and separate your matrices if you so choose. So you get smaller matrices for your inversion, and it should be a bit faster if you're not using block diagonal approaches. So that's graph coherence. Uh, DAGs are quite reasonable and useful to apply here. Uh, I've shown you a few applications of them that are more general and more uh, useful perhaps than just simply grouped coherence. Uh, the disjoint graphs with cross-validation, simpler reconciliation structures by choosing not to reconcile some parts of the structure. Uh, you can do really complex unbalanced things like the GDP example. And if you've got data in a hierarchy that is observed at different frequencies, uh, it can help you here as well. So as a recap for the graph structure or graph theory versions of these concepts, hierarchical coherence is a polytree, grouped is a DAG, but it has some constraints, some further restriction. And if we relax that restriction, we get graph coherence and that is quite a useful tool for those reasons. So we have this nested approach. Okay, so what else? What's next? Uh, you get some other benefits from having, uh, in Fable, for instance, in a software approach, you get access to the graph theory algorithms. Uh, you can also visualize your hierarchy a little bit easier, slice and dice it into subtrees. Uh, so computationally, it's very neat. Um, and you get to leverage a lot of the common familiar grammar of graph theory when manipulating your data with this coherence constraint. Uh, I'm also thinking about visualizing these time series. For instance, you can compute some features and plot those features on the graph structure so you can see how strong your seasonality is at various disaggregates in the graph. Uh, future work, the Fable package is being extended to support graph reconciliation. And in fact, it will take a graph first approach uh, where the Sybil structure, the time series structure, will incorporate that graph directly. And that allows you to filter out various subparts of the graph if you only wanted to focus on Australian income GDP based approaches, for instance. Uh, at this conference, and the reason why I love coming here, I had the chance to chat to Danny, and we came up to a convergent, like convergent evolution. We've come to the same solution from very different angles. So it's, I'm interested in exploring that uh, concept a bit more. Uh, Danny's called this generally linear constrained time series, uh, taking a matrix approach, an optimization approach, 
and I've taken a software and graph theory approach and we've come to what we believe is the same solution. So that's really validating to hear that I'm not crazy here and I'm going on the right path. <laughs> and I think there's also some opportunity to consider other reconciliation approaches to get coherent forecasts using the structure of the graph as well. So perhaps there's some graph algorithms here that might help with the nonlinearity. Um, that's uh, only a thought at this stage. OK, that's it for me. So thank you for your time. You can find some links, the slides, the source code up above. And once again, first year PhD student, please rate this session. Uh, the QR code's there for your convenience. It'll take you right to the link. Uh, please rate my session. Thank you.